Hello, Dr. John. How are you? At first, okay, hello. <laughs> welcome okay. here in Egypt, virtually. Okay. So I will introduce him, please. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Welcome. John, Dr. Aziz Zidane is a chairperson for our sessions today. She made a great effort in all <laughs> the four talks. <laughs> 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 okay. Welcome, Dr. John. Welcome Thank again, you. our all dear guests. Technology can improve the quality of teaching pathology, especially with emergence of COVID-19 pandemic. To know how to design effective learning using technology, let's welcome Prof. Joan, Professor Joan Sanders. Professor Joan is a professor of medical education and director of medical education, innovation and the scholarship, faculty of health, social care and medicine, Edge Hill University, UK, and the co-lead of the Improving Professional Practice Research Team in the faculty. He's a member of the Health Research Institute, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Educators and Higher Education Academy, and a co-chair of the ME Technology Enhanced Learning Committee. He has received major funding for national and international projects. His research has led to over 130 peer-reviewed publications. He has provided faculty development workshops in both UK and international. So welcome, Professor Joan. Now the mic is yours, please. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for the warm welcome. It's a great privilege and honour to be talking to you today. Thank you. My, my background is a, is a clinician, that's how I started, and I got increasingly interested in medical education, and I've actually been involved with medical education, I was just thinking about it, for 45 years, and that includes teaching junior doctors. So, much, I would just say, there's quite a lot of experience, and I was involved in the development of teaching CD-ROMs in the late 90s, and that's when I became interested in using technology for teaching and learning. And subsequently, I was involved in developing the first UK, uh, which was also an international course, on public health. And that's where I got more and more uh, and greater interest in using technology. So what I hope to share with you today is my experience. And I think we need to remember that I w my, my whole ethos and focus is about working with colleagues to make sure that when they want to use technology for teaching and learning, that it is most effective. And to make it relevant, I was involved 
uh, when I was at Leeds working with colleagues who were pathologists, um, where we looked at the development and implementation and evaluation of a high resolution wall sized virtual microscope. Now, over these 40 years, and, and particularly over the last, what, 20 odd years, where I've had a major focus in the use of technology, I've had a few major problems. And I think all of us involved in education have. But, you know, this is a typical one of a few years ago. And it still surprises me now. Students were unaware of the existence of some technology-enhanced learning modules. They thought the modules wouldn't be useful. They didn't have the time to use them in the final year, and they would have preferred to have them earlier in the course. So even though we developed these modules of high quality, they didn't get into practical use. So what I intend to cover today is the evidence base, because it's OK having experience and anecdote, but we also need a clear evidence base to inform our decisions. That I want to highlight the complexity of educational interventions using technology, and that has implications for the design and implementation for maximum learning, and particularly highlight the importance of usability testing and iterative development. So moving on now. Although this was a few years ago, there really hasn't been such a large meta-analysis of online learning studies. And all the smaller studies that I've seen since this date just resonate and are fully aligned to this meta-analysis. And this looked at the whole spectrum of online learning. And I think number one we have to remember is that students do not necessarily learn any better using technology than face-to-face -face instruction. And the first question I always ask colleagues is, why do you want to use technology? Now, there may be huge advantages, particularly, say, during the COVID pandemic, but we have to remember that it's not necessarily any better at improving learning outcomes. That instruction which combines face-to-face -face and online elements are superior to pure online instruction, and that the effectiveness of online learning appears to be consistent across a huge range of content and learner types. That the use of videos or online quizzes don't appear to influence the amount that students necessarily learn online. And that's probably because online learning is best enhanced by giving learners control over their interactions with any media and prompting learner reflection. It's this engagement that we need to develop rather than just viewing content. And the effect sizes were largest for studies in which there was collaborative or instructor-directed learning and teaching. So what we're looking at is that it's not just putting your powerpoints on the uh, on the on the on the net or providing a video that is information provision what we do want to do is to engage students with learning try and have an element of face to face and to be able to share with colleagues now if we look at the complexity of teaching with technology there are numerous factors. There's the learner, the content that we want to deliver, the instructional approach to deliver the content, the technology to deliver the content and be part of the instructional approach, and ultimately the context. And that first example I gave you was, was highlighting that the context was not adequately thought about. And all these factors have to be in alignment, because if one factor is not addressed, technology-enhanced learning will not be effective. So if we want to do effective teaching with technology, we need to decide, to design and develop, to deliver and to evaluate. So let's look at decision. 
The first one is why do we want to use technology? For the virtual microscope example, this was a novel, innovative technology, and it had lots of perceived advantages. And colleagues that have seen virtual microscopes, you can see the whole picture of a, of, of a tissue, but then progressively focus on specific cells and what's in those cells. And that is difficult to do to a larger audience. And if we look at some of the contextual factors which enable technology-enhanced learning, these seem to be pretty persistent and common. And in fact, we did a recent review published in Medical Teacher, which looked at the experiences during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Previous experience of online learning by staff and students enabled it, having adequate technology, rapid response by the institution to change, having a small leadership team, support by learning technologists, and innovation by teachers who were enthusiastic. And some of the barriers, not surprisingly, were lack of planning, lack of adequate resources, people and technology, usability problems such as poor internet connectivity, access to devices and competing social and domestic activities, a limited interactivity between teachers and students. Students like to have a sense of belonging and over a period of time, if it is completely remote, this begins to disappear and impairs significantly their learning. I've often called it the loneliness of the long distance learner. So if we want to provide content, is it knowledge we want to provide? Do we want students to have simple information? Do we want them to gain increasing understanding? Do we want them to be able to, be able to apply that knowledge? Do we want to, be able to um, do we want students about to analyze it, bring together information and evaluate? We need to think, is it just facts they need or much more about developing conceptual understanding? That has implications for the design. Or is it skills we want to teach? Because knowledge and skills are different, as we know. And is it attitudes? Do we want to change beliefs and values? We also need to consider what type of learner do you want? And this is a major factor for determining the instructional approach. Because basically the instructional approach is about getting information into the heads of the learner. And is this going to be a passive behaviourist approach, such as just providing a PowerPoint? Or is it going to be active, where there is interactivity, either with the content, which is cognitive constructivist, or social, which is social constructivist, we are, where we are sharing ideas? But as I've shown earlier, there needs to be a, some type of interactivity of the student and the content. And that is a key design instructional approach factor to consider. Now, what we need to also remember is that our mind, our memory, has a, has a finite size, short term memory. So all the information that we are having at any moment in time goes into short term memory. But only a small amount of what goes into long term memory can be remembered and recalled at a later date. So, for example, when you put on your clothes in the morning, a lot of information will be going into your short term memory. Putting on clothes, cleaning your teeth, getting washed, combing your hair. But actually, we don't remember that. I, I would struggle to remember uh, exactly how I put on my shoes this morning or how I combed my hair. So going into short term memory, we've got text, visual information and audio information. 
But we have to remember that only a small amount of that can be handled by the short-term memory to go into long-term memory. And this is called cognitive load theory. Now, Richard Mayer did numerous experiments, and I'll flip through them, but if you want to read about it, there's a fantastic book, and it's got more recent uh, um, uh, 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 editions. But essentially what he did was to find out what works and doesn't work. People learn better when a multimedia presentation has a conversational style. That seems to engage people and helps them to learn better. People learn better when they are encouraged to develop and generate self-explanations. People don't necessarily learn better from animation than from static diagrams. They learn better when the same information is not presented in more than one format. So having text and images going on at the same time the learner's memory, short-term memory, is bombarded with information and one of them may stick or not stick. So you may remember the lovely diagram, but you may not remember what that diagram was about. And people learn better when information is presented in short segments. And people learn better when there is less information rather than more, say on a PowerPoint presentation. I'm giving this sequentially and short amount and in small amounts progressively. And there's a few more here. They learn deeply from words and pictures, from words alone. They learn better when they're integrated at the same place and same time. And they learn better from graphics and narration than graphics and printed text. Now, if we want to structure this, instru uh, this, um, this way that we're going to present content, Robert Gagne provides a useful model of instruction. And you can read about it if you want to read his book, but you can also find it on many, many websites. And he talks about, first of all, you have to gain the learner's attention. You inform them of what they're going to be learning about. You stimulate the recall of prior learning. You might say, you might give them a quiz or you might ask them to think about something. You give the content. You tell them what, how they're going to go through that content to learn. You often give them an opportunity to practice. And if they do have practice, you give them feedback. Some form of assessment is important and some discussion of, how, of what this means practically of transfer to a work situation is important. And this is an example of an electrolyte workshop, which I thought would be more relevant to your needs in pathology. As you can see, it's engaging. It grabs the attention of the learner. It says what it's going to include. It gives certain options, a walkthrough and a hands-on. It, it, and it, it, it's neatly laid out, and yet it's very clear what the actions are going to be and that there is some degree of interactivity. So if we are going to construct it, we will have, like any teaching, we will have some specific learning objectives, which we hope the learner will acquire by the end of the learning experience. And we need to think, what are these at the various levels of knowledge, skills and attitudes? And for each of these at learning objectives, we need to have alignment with specific learning activities. And each of these learning activities need to have appropriate technologies to allow those learning activities to occur. So, for example, if we want to deliver content, we can have PowerPoints, podcasts and videos through uh, or other types of software packages. If we, we can also direct the learner to resources which are already out there, such as websites, videos or social media. We also want to develop collaboration and interaction. So what about tasks? You get them to do something, to think about something, to give them quizzes 
to enable a discussion, such as having a discussion forum, a wiki, a blog, or within the social network. And also, it's useful to help learners to collate their learning so that they can describe or reflect on what they've learned, such as in a portfolio structure. But we have to remember that if we are going to design effective e-learning, that learners actually make critical choices about when, where and how to study. For example, if you look at postgraduate, many postgraduate courses and many undergraduate courses, when do students actually access the content? It's often in the evenings and it's often at weekends. And this has implications for the provision of support services to students. Are your support services available at the evenings and at weekends? Learners also like to keep their social and university use of technology separate. This is quite debatable because students undoubtedly like to use their own devices. But if that means taking those devices and using them in, in say, lecture theatres or on placements, what happens if they get lost or they're broken? Who's responsible for it? Learners also like to personalise and adapt their technology tools and environments. And a few years ago, when people started to introduce tablet devices, students said, well, why do I need a tablet device and a mobile phone? Why can't I use a mobile phone? And nowadays, things are beginning to change where the mobile phones are beginning to merge much more like tablet devices. So although I have a very small iPhone still, the latest iPhones are much larger and more like a tablet device. And learners do prefer to use familiar technologies. <coughs> Now, using technology can also be incredibly frustrating, like we all know. And an important consideration is usability. Excuse me, please. And usability is the extent to which a product is actually useful to the learner to achieve the purpose that they want it to achieve. And this is because to use a technology Individuals make a judgment about the perceived usefulness of it, but also about the perceived ease of use. So, for example, looking at these airline tickets, which one would we find the easiest to use? If we wanted to find the seat, know which terminal and which seat to go to. I think most people would say the bottom one. Yet they are given very similar bits of information. So the layout, the way information is presented, the font size, all those need to be carefully thought about, the amount of information that you are actually viewing, and making sure that information is absolutely essential. If we do want to do usability testing, we don't need to have many people to show us that there are problems. And research suggests that as few as five learners can identify 85% of problems or issues. The other one is to give it to the least competent user. <coughs> Excuse me. And the least competent user is somebody who is not used to using technology or that way of learning. <coughs> so for effective teaching with technology, we need to constantly evaluate <coughs> because this evaluation will influence all the other stages. <coughs> Sorry, I've had a cold for the last few days. Please take your time, Dr. Professor Joe. <coughs> Just take a few minutes. So finally. It's okay. Um, <coughs> For effective technology and teaching, we need to consider the complexity, the alignment, and usability testing. 
and here's some information that you might find useful. <coughs> so, thank you very much. I'd be delighted to ask, answer any Thanks. Thank you, Professor John, for your valuable recommendations. I hope this experience inspires medical schools to digitalize their curricula effectively. So now time for oral questions for Professor John. Please raise hands and keep your questions to the point, please. Any questions? Or in chat box? Please, Yasmin. So, thank you, Professor John. Thank you, Professor John. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. I wish you all well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye okay. then. Thank you, Bye. Professor John, for you. Uh, the kind uh, presence of you in the event and for your time. We really enjoyed the presentation and we hope you have you in next uh, events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, we benefited a lot from uh, the recommendations and we made uh, highlighted some points for us in the in enhancing uh, student, uh, interactivity of students and student-centered learning to make uh, students uh, get better outcomes of their learning. Uh, thank you very much and uh, we hope that you get well soon but we won't make it uh, longer for you. Thanks a lot. Okay, Thanks. thank you very much enough. indeed everyone. It's, it's, <laughs> and you. have a great day and it's been lovely to share my experiences with you and I hope you find the day are useful so thank you very much indeed. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you, bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Um, now, let's explore Helwan medical school experience in using different available and feasible technological tools to boost student satisfaction with their learning. Let's welcome Dr. Fatma Al Zahra Al Khamisi. Dr. Fatma is a lecturer of pathology at the Faculty of Medicine, Helwan University, Cairo, Egypt. She occupied many positions in the faculty, including being an academic coordinator for preclinical phase students, the assistant head for international students' office, being a member of the examination committee and the community service committee at the faculty. She obtained a master's degree in health professions education from Maastricht and Suez Canal Universities. She is a member of the Association for Medical Education in Europe and the Association for the Study of Medical Education. She is also a certified virtual patient learner. Since promoting to a lecturer, she implemented many innovative instructional and formative assessment methods. She has internationally published articles in pathology and medical education and has accepted presentations at international conferences, including the ME and the APMEC conferences, and is a reviewer in some international journals. So please, Dr. Fatma, the mic is yours Thank now. You. Go ahead. Thank you, Professor Azza, for the nice. Uh, introduction. I'm certified virtual patient learning trainer, by the way, not virtual patient learning. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Thanks. Is the screen uh, clear for everyone? Is the shared screen obvious for everyone? Yeah. Yes, I think so. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we will share our experience. At first, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. We will share our experience in the pathology department in uh, overcoming some of the learning challenges faced uh, during the e-learning uh, approach, uh, which were uh, emerged by uh, which emerged by the COVID nineteen pandemic. And we will discuss some approaches that were used. And at the end, I will show you the responses of the students uh, for uh, our um, des a design course, our design tools. At first, the, our problem was is that with the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic, the traditional face-to-face -face learning transferred suddenly to uh, e-learning. This, this raised several challenges, and these challenges uh, decreased student satisfaction as reported by us and also by many medical schools in the literature. Challenging limitations um, reported, or some of the challenging lim limitations reported, were the loss of students' ab ability to self-regulate -re and motivate themselves, loss of socialization and interaction with peers and faculty, sorry, and loss of hands-on experience and the ability to develop several competencies, including also the practical skills. Hilwan Medical School was no exception uh, for the face challenges. However, to overcome these challenges in pathology, we designed a, an interactive e-pathology course during the locomotor module. It was targeting the first level medical students and was implemented from March through May 2021. And we evaluated the course through students' responses. During the design of the e-course, our focus and goals were to enhance students' motivation to learn and enhancing their role and, um, in their learning and interaction in the different aspects of the learning, learning process. We targeted students' higher cognitive functions and we were um, wishing to stimulate students' higher cognitive functions like intellectual skills, um, analysis, evaluation, and creation besides application. We emphasize the relation and relevance of what students learn in pathology and their, the students' future practice. And we wanted to stimulate self-learning and reflection of students and continuously assess the students' learning. To achieve these goals, we implemented several tools inside that uh, designed, especially designed e-course. These tools uh, varied in lectures, practical labs, formative assessment and assignments, and also for the online office hours. For lectures, we used multiple methods. One of the methods used were, was virtual learning stations approach. Learning stations is a learning approach, an interactive actually learning approach in which students engage in a series of learning activities distributed on several stations. Students pass from station or in the face-to-face -face physical space, students pass from table to table, which are from station to station, and in each station they have a chunk of learning material they study together and then they trans, uh, transfer to the next station to study a next chunk of learning material and so on. In medical education, learning stations are mainly used in the practical and assessment um, uh, practical assessment um, uh, experience of students, but not in lectures. We wanted to give uh, students the same experience in lecture and also virtually. To do so, we used the Zoom platform. We, we explained the approach to students first, and then in the live uh, online lecture, we distributed stu students upon several breakout rooms into teams. And we sent them for stage one of the le online lecture, sent them a small chunk of the learning material of the lecture with one or two objectives of the objectives designed for the lecture. Students inside the teams interacted with each other, read the learning material sent, and discussed uh, the material with, with each other. Then, and, all, and then they have a ta had a task inside uh, the station. So, after understanding the material, they had to apply on the same task to make sure that they understood the material correctly. After that, 
we regathered students again in the main meeting room and uh, we, just, we asked the students to share with us their solutions for the task to make sure that they could apply properly. And we uh, clarified any ambiguous concepts within the first chunk of the learning material of the lecture. Again, after that, we sent students to um, several breakout rooms again and sent them a new chunk of learning material of the lecture with a new task to apply on. And I'm sorry. And then re reunited them again in the lecture to discuss with them their findings and any ambiguous concepts and so on till uh, the lecture objectives are completed and students here study the learning objectives actually by themselves through collaborative interactive learning right inside the online session. Uh, to know more about uh, or to see the, the process from students' perspectives, we decided to do a short demo for you now. And we will uh, send you in breakout rooms to station number one, actually. But uh, uh, please, with um, the, your mics turned off, you will just be the audience or the, uh, you will notice how students interact inside the room and how do they apply in the task. It's a simplified demo, OK? not the real task, of course, or real learning material, material. and they, they will come again here with me to discuss simply and in short the, that the solutions they offered for the, or they got for the tasks, and uh, I hope you enjoy this learning experience. So, Abraham, please, can you uh, activate the breakout rooms? Do I do that? Okay. Uh, kindly, you will be, you will see now, you will see now a request to join a breakout room, right? Kindly uh, accept the request. Guys, are we all here? Yes, room number one is here. Okay, room number two. Room number two, are you here? Yes, we are. Okay, for station number one, uh, team number one, what did you find for the comparison between carcinoma and sarcoma as types of cancer? Did you find any differences? Yes, and we made a table for that. Okay, can you share it, please? Yes, of course. Uh, doctor, can you stop sharing to yeah, be able to share this content? Stop sharing. Okay. Okay, please. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, it's clear. Okay, so after we read the following lines in the paragraphs of the comparison, we made this table. And uh, we compared carcinoma from sarcoma uh, in, uh, from different aspects, like the tissue of origin and the tissue examples for that origin. Uh, also the blood supply and the metastasis spread and the preferred route of metastasis. So uh, I'll start with the origin. Uh, the carcinoma originates from epithelial tissue while sarcoma originates from mesenchymal tissues. Uh, examples for epithelial tissue is uh, like skin and glands, while the sarcoma uh, mesenchymal tissue is fat, bone, and cartilage. Uh, as for the blood supply, the carcinoma has poor blood supply, and that was shown clearly in the diagrams below. Uh, they are not here in the table, but it was uh, presented in the case. It okay. looked more pale. It wasn't red, as it has poor blood supply. Okay. However, the sarcoma is very rich in blood supply in comparison with carcinoma, and that's why it looked red. Okay, thank you, Noor, for that. Okay. So you got the differences, you got the idea of the differences between carcinoma and sarcoma correctly. Yes, okay, sure. Okay, for team number two, okay. Uh, di did you have any uh, differences else, uh, also? Yes, we did, and we also point, and we also made uh, a table for comparison. Okay. We do have a couple different points uh, from them. Uh, if you would allow us to share it, please, that would be great. Okay. 
So uh, they've already spoken about the tissue of origin, obviously epithelial tissue for carcinomas and mesenchymal tissue for, for sarcomas. We would like to add a point when it comes to blood supply. Uh, since sarcomas already come from heavily vascular tissue, they obviously have a higher, uh, a higher blood supply, a higher level of metastasis, and then uh, they would obviously spread by um, blood a lot faster. That would be their main, uh, their main way Way of metastasis. While when it comes to carcinomas, they have their, their blood supply because they are a cancer, but they come from avascular tissue. And since they come from avascular tissue, the blood supply is less. So their main way of metastasis is uh, lymphatic drainage. And when they spread by, by blood, that means they are in a very late stage that they have reached um, a, main, a, main, um, uh, a main artery or vein. Okay, thank you, Yasmin, for that. Okay, so both are uh, contains their blood supply because cancers can form their blood supply in the process uh, of androgenesis. However, sarcoma spread early by blood. Okay, thank you, Yasmin. Uh, does anyone have uh, anything that is not uh, clear and want me to explain it? Or uh, did you get the point of the differences between carcinoma and sarcoma? Okay. Uh, for those who are raising their hands, questions will be at the end of the talk. Okay, thank you, Yasmin, for that. I hope that uh, guests, um, guests caught the idea of stations actually very fast. We will do a demo for station number two very fast. Just yeah, read uh, that definition and, <laughs> and start the application. Okay. So, please join the same rooms again. You now have a request to join, right? This is the second chunk of information in the lecture, which is the staging. Okay, most of us are here. I hope that students... I hope that uh, my students um, managed to... Um, show you the experience, the interactive experience of the learning stations. Uh, I am supposed to ask students after uh, uh, being in the main room, uh, so what is the staging? How did you apply on that model? What is the staging? And they will tell me TNM, TX, and XMX, and I will ask them, why did you get that? Why did you choose this staging level to make sure that they understood the main and basic idea. Okay, will room number one start or room number two? Okay, we won't uh, now <laughs> discuss your results. Okay, <laughs> thank you. This is the virtual learning stations. Actually, the virtual learning stations um, is for the first time is used in lectures in medical education at Halwan Medical School. And for more information, you can review uh, our publication in the uh, Journal of Inter Interactive Learning Environments. It's a Q1 journal in education. Uh, the article is now under print and it is supposed to go online uh, within uh, seven uh, to uh, seven days, I think one week, two, two weeks maximum. The second approach used for, uh, to make uh, lectures interactive is the flipped classroom. And actually, many medical schools depended on flipped classroom in uh, enhancing the interactivity of students in lectures during the COVID-19 pandemic. Flipped classroom uh, is a learning approach in which students are, uh, are uh, the, the learning process is flipped. What's meant by flipped? Normally, students are introduced uh, to the content, new content at school. Then at home, they apply and do projects and homework and so on. In the flip, flip format of the lectures, students are introduced to the content at home before the uh, lecture itself. And then they practice working through uh, the content inside the lecture, like application and so on. We used also flipped classroom for lectures in our design e-course, and we depended mainly on case-based uh, format uh, to um, make students uh, use their higher cognitive functions like intellectual skills and evaluation. The third uh, approach used was virtual patient learning. 
And uh, virtual patient learning uh, is, um, we use it in a flipped uh, format. Uh, we send the students the, the, uh, the learning material before the lecture itself. Um, the material was about uh, diseases. It was the locomotor module. It's like osteoporosis, osteomalacia, rickets, and so on. Then after that, in the online live session, we uh, used an approach similar to virtual patients uh, to uh, make them think and evaluate the case and um, discuss uh, what they think of with the symptoms, signs, pathogenesis, and so on. Virtual patients are defined as a computer-based simulated patient to train students in an interactive way. However, we did some modification with that. And allow me please to say hello. Good evening, doctor. Good evening. Uh, who is there? My name is Amina, doctor. My sister is your patient. Hello, Amina. How can I help you? Well, I'm not feeling well at all. Uh, so why don't you visit me at the clinic uh, to get a proper physical examination? No, I'm afraid I could catch corona. I haven't taken my vaccine shots yet. Don't you have time to help me now? No, it's okay. Uh, so what's uh, your health problem that made you call me? Well, as I have told you before, I'm not feeling well at all. Uh, so, uh, what made you call me? What hurts? It's, it's a long-standing problem, doctor. My body hurts me a lot. It's, it's, I can't tolerate the pain. So, you have um, pain in all your body? And it's a long standing. Is there anything new or the call is just for the long standing pain? Yes, yes. My bone hurts me everywhere in my body. Your bone hurts you. Okay. Uh, how old are you, uh, Amina? I'm, I'm 70, doctor. 70 years. God bless your health. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you married? You have children? Yes. Yes, I'm married, but no children. Okay, do you, uh, are you um, of course, uh, are, uh, you are in menopausal, right? Yes, almost for 25 years. So do you take any hormone replacement therapy? No, no, not at all. Okay, are you a smoker? No, I have never smoked in my life. Okay, so uh, please uh, tell me, do you have uh, recent fractures? Yes, I, I, I had two fractures in the past year. The first one was at the edge of the foot table. Uh -huh. I fractured my right arm, but uh -huh. that was four months ago. Before that, I flipped in the bathroom and I fractured my hip. That was almost half a year ago. Okay, but now you are healed, right? Or do you have any casts? Present in your no, no. Okay. I took it up a few weeks ago. Okay, so do you have any other uh, illness or do you take uh, any drug for whatever health problem you have? Well, yes, since childhood, uh, I had bronchial asthma and I used to take cortisone containing drugs and bronchodilators, but I have been free. Of symptoms for the last two years yeah okay uh, I see okay uh, Madame Amina I will uh, write um, some investigations lab tests and imaging please do them and visit me in the clinic okay I will send them right now to you okay thank you doctor thank you so much and you're welcome anytime okay goodbye goodbye doctor Hello. Good evening, doctor. How are you doing today? I'm fine. How is talking? Don't you remember me? I'm Amina. 
Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, can you please remind me of you? Yes, I, I called you a week ago because I had bony aches all over my body. And you yeah. gave me some laboratory investigations to do. Yeah, but the results were, came out today. You were the patient that had uh, two fractures, one on the foot, uh, at the foot table, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you got the, your results. So can you please send them to me now? Yes. Okay, I got them. Okay, your labs are fine, but the imaging um, shows that you have somewhat weak bones. Okay, so I will... Uh, I will write you a treatment plan and a follow-up plan, uh, and you will follow up with me on blood tests and imaging, okay? Yes, doctor. That sounds okay. great. Thank okay. you so much for your help. God bless you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. And now we can ask students. Actually, we can ask them at any stage of this role play. This was one of the methods used in the lectures in a, a flipped uh, format. We can ask students at any an open discussion at any point from symptoms and signs to why do you think the patient complains of whatever? Uh, what are the risk factors or predisposing factors? Uh, what investigations you may ask for? Um, or uh, what is the provisional diagnosis or differential diagnosis or even your definitive diagnosis at the, at the um, end of the case. Students actually were very motivated uh, in this method of learning. They felt like real doctor, doctors, especially they were first year students uh, with uh, too much basic medical sciences compared to the clinical part in the curriculum. So this, should, uh, this uh, method was one of the methods that got um, very good feedback. We also used uh, traditional interactive uh, Zoom-based uh, lectures, online lectures, but they were few. So for lectures, we used four approaches, uh, the flipped classroom with case learning, the virtual patient learning, with our, the virtual patient simulated role plays, uh, the uh, virtual learning stations, and traditional online interactive uh, lectures. For labs, we use digital pathology. Uh, actually, we don't have the platforms. Uh, but however, we uh, got some assistance from <laughs> universities that uh, offer their slides freely, like Leeds University, University of Michigan, and National University of Singapore. And I won't uh, repeat um, what was uh, discussed in details with Dr. Samayad, uh, but uh, I will add that we use digital uh, pathology uh, slides and posts in a histopathology format. So this is a simplified report because they were first year students, but we uh, added the links to the uh, digital pathology slides and posts inside the report. And we asked students to fill some part of the report and uh, they, uh, they, the students felt the relevance of what they take to the future practice because they see the report and also they see uh, a slide while they were taking their e-learning without coming to the, to the medical school. For formative assessment and assignments, we used two approaches. For assignments first, we used project-based learning. Project-based learning is an inquiry-based approach based on constructivism theory. In other words, learners construct a product by assembling prior knowledge and experience with newer activities that give them new knowledge and experience. We wanted to target the creation uh, level of higher cognitive functions at, of students. So, and also we needed to emphasize that students deeply learn the learning material. So we asked them to create uh, e-learning material, simplified actually, e-learning forms uh, like memes, videos, brochures, posters, whatever they like but with the point that they should simplify what they took. So in order to simplify the learning material, they need first to understand it deeply, right? 
if someone don't know what is a meme, a meme is an image with you piece of text, uh, typically humorous in nature, and uh, is spread on social media, like like parts of a film or a scene from a play, a, a play, a film, a match, uh, and so on. So here you can see some selected uh, memes. Students created. Students actually created. Uh, memes in number higher numbers exceeding what was required from them. For example, here for uh, the uh, tumors, they selected this um, actor uh, with this face expression for fibrous tissues, a normal tissue, but with the benign tumor, somewhat uh, angry, and for the malignant fibrosarcoma, he, he is very angry. Or may, maybe here in this mem, in which they they quoted a, a shot from a match, and they tried to 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 uh, to elaborate on the idea of that immune system tries to catch the malignant cells and um, and kill them. However, the malignant tumor can uh, escape the uh, the immune system and cause immune tolerance. These are also some of the memes. Uh, this one is very simple. This is Drake, you know, the singer. Uh, this uh, meme was to um, emphasize that osteomalacia occurs in adults, while rickets uh, doesn't occur in adults, it occurs in children, and so on. For more about the students' uh, perspectives, actually, students perceived this method as very fun, and they were very creative. And... Uh, for more information about uh, the MEMS as a project-based learning, uh, I hope you join us at the next Asia-Pacific Medical Education Conference. Uh, as we will uh, give a presentation there about MEMS as a project-based learning in enhancing pathology learning. They also, some students also created the simplified, so somewhat simplified posters, and some students created videos like this one, we see rapidly. Rickets. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Mm. A share sound. How does it look like? Bowing legs, inflamed peripheral joints, dental hypoplasia, and slow skull closure among other presentations show on children with rickets. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it is relatively common in Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Researchers have found that in the past 15 years, incidents of rickets have doubled, going from 1 every 200,000 to 1 every 100,000. In Egypt, two of the 100 studied infants below the age of 2 had rickets. So, what can cause rickets? Calcium deficiency and vitamin D deficiency and malabsorption. Calcium is needed to strengthen bones, while vitamin D is needed for calcium to enter bones. It can be absent in diet or lost due to spending less time outdoors or having vitamin D malabsorption most commonly caused by kidney problems. What is going on? Calcium concentration in blood serum decreases, stimulating the parathyroid glands to secrete parathormone, which liberates calcium from bones, resulting in soft bones. Or, if calcium is there but vitamin D... For watching i hope you enjoyed samples of students work actually they were very productive productive and actually we discovered that we can um, uh, ask students to help us with uh, preparing uh, material in a simplified and funny way and also that like videos because um, the students colleagues who saw that video learned from it actually maybe more was more beneficial for them than that traditional lecture 
So, I'm sorry. Rickets. This was uh, for the assignments. For continuous formative assessment, we actually assess students after each lecture online via a game-based uh, learning platform, which was the Kahoot. Kahoot is a freely available uh, game-based platform. At, at first, I want to clarify what is game-based learning. Game-based learning is where uh, learning is mixed with elements of the game. Like, do you see here, a countdown, a limited time, to do the task, like uh, having colorful platform or colorful interface, like having thrilling music, like having the element of scores and the challenge. So the Kahoot actually uh, offers all these criteria in a platform that creates quizzes for students. So after each lecture, we uh, created a weekly, uh, each lecture was uh, weekly. And so weekly, we created challenges between students uh, well, through uh, sharing a link to an online uh, quiz and students uh, press on the link and start playing and answering the questions the faster and the correct uh, the answer, the higher the scores. And after that, we got our champions for each quiz, and we uh, to motivate them more, we um, issued certificates of appreciation for the champions. And now, I want you to to have that experience to show to to know what uh, students see inside or experience inside uh, this uh, this uh, quiz. So uh, I will send you in the chat now. A link for a very rapid quiz. We are not <laughs> assessing you, of course, but uh, to encourage you, maybe uh, you try, yeah, uh, you, you try to use it in your uh, learning context, uh, there is a, a link for a Kahoot challenge. It will not take uh, a minute. Uh, kindly press on the link and uh, you will find a screen that asks you to enter a name or a nickname. Kindly enter whatever name you like, then press next and have fun. I'm waiting for you here. Uh, meet wi uh, within one way, minute. If you finish, finished, finish the quiz. Okay, I will wait for a few more seconds. Yes, okay. That's great. Thank you, beautiful and interactive tool. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. Actually, myself, I myself, the first time I tried it, I enjoyed it. That's why I decided to give my students that experience. Thank you, Dr. Shuru. Actually, we published a paper, but not in this e-course. Actually, before that, during the face-to-face -face learning, we published a paper about the perceptions of students using Kahoot distantly, of course, but in uh, a blended uh, learning path, uh, blended learning approach. If you want to check it, it is uh, here. And students actually, uh, I think you notice that it is uh, very well perceived. Some students reported that they feel threatened by the countdown and the rapid uh, moving of the timer. And some also um, reported to me that um, the music makes me feel um, in a race. Uh, but uh, most of the students uh, liked the, the experience. And actually, uh, we can do that in a challenge between all students synchronously or every student can get uh, a Kahoot link like you did now and practice many times uh, during the course on that, um, on that link and no one of his other colleagues will know his scores. But in the competition uh, approach or the, yeah, the, the Kahoot offers two uh, methods of practicing, either individual personal practicing, okay, or this doesn't share uh, scores with other colleagues, or, but shares with the instructor, by the way, or the live competition between students. And here, 
all students see um, the list of winners and see the scores of their other colleagues. And in either way, the instructor can follow the students in their learning and see the scores. So this was for the continuous formative assessment. Let's now see the students' responses. We evaluated uh, students' satisfaction via an online survey using five-point Likert scale and some close in questions with three and four for satisfactory and very satisfactory, zero and one, zero for very unsatisfactory, and one for unsatisfactory, two for neutral. We also evaluated the student satisfaction for those who learned the same course via traditional e-learning with pre-recorded lectures and labs. We found that student satisfaction for the designed e-course was highly st significant statistically compared to the traditional e-learning of the same course. And for the designed e-course group, 73% uh, of students uh, agree that this e-course is a good alternative to face-to-face -to -face learning during the COVID-19 pandemic for the pathology learning. We also asked students to rank each tool inside this course um, and all tools got a score um, between 3.5 and 4 out of 4. However, the highest, uh, the highly ranked, or the highest ranked uh, tools inside the course were digital slides and pods, histopathological reports, and the online Kahoot uh, formative assessment competitions. For the advantage, we ask the students for their um, uh, perception about the advantages of the used methods. And in descending orders, students reported that the, the e course with the old tools used. Uh, provided them with more fun learning experience, deeper understanding, more interaction, more motivation to learn, less stressful learning, more focus on details, less boredom or less boring learning environment, longer knowledge retention, and more effective feedback and more commitment to study. For the disadvantage or limitation, as expected, and as we met in this event, the primary reported limitation was unstable network. So, as you see, I think that uh, you agree with me that the used course with the varying methods uh, included in it filled the, ga the gap reported uh, of uh, the gap of the traditional e-learning compared to face-to-face -to -face learning. Students so reported the advantages of the e-course include more interaction, right? Uh, more interaction in their learning and where, uh, with their peers and also with the instructor, right? Uh, Student-centered learning. Students actually in most of the approaches were responsible for their learning with uh, some guidance of the teacher. More relevance to practice, to future practice, right? Like uh, for the uh, histopathological reports and the digital pathology and also for the virtual patient learning. And also analysis of the higher cognitive functions like, uh, sorry, stimulation of the higher cognitive functions like uh, evaluation, application, let's start with application, analysis, evaluation, and even we reach the creation level by the project-based learning. And all these tools, by the way, were used uh, in distant learning, not in a blended form, in pathology course. However, students' responses were very good. So, uh, in summary, enriching pathology e-learning by interactive activities boosts students' satisfaction of their learning and enhances developing their competences from students' perspectives. However, a point to stress on that from students' perspectives, interactive digital learning of practical skills was the most satisfying. And I think uh, this is um, to somewhat maybe predicted because students want to feel like doctors, right? From the day one in medical school, they got hit by uh, high knowledge, high uh, uh, loads, loads of uh, basic knowledge. However, they don't like that. They want to feel like doctors. So 
this was our designed e-course. I hope you enjoyed it and you find some ideas to apply in your uh, courses. And um, if uh, any one of you want more details, want to apply the course in um, his or her context, learning context, however, wants uh, more information, you can email me or uh, you can email me and my email, by the way, present in uh, in the brochures and announcements of the event and was on the slide. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatma, for um, the innovative and practical ideas presented. I hope this experience inspires medical schools to enhance interactivity in their online pathology curricula. Thank you. Uh, it was very a uh, nice presentation, really. And, uh, and I, I admire it. Thank you. My pride. Thank you. <laughs> now, time for questions. Please uh, raise hands for any questions. Or in chat box. May? Uh, Dr. Ahmad Samir is raising hand, right? Yes. Can we unmute him, please? Okay, I will. Uh, um. Hello? Yeah. A special thanks to your attendance and talk. But, but, what about uh, like hoot the silent space uh, as a programmed questions to learn us link for connect uh, i'm sorry can you clarify your question you are asking about kahoot yes yeah uh, you're asking that kahoot um, is a form of distant learning with uh, no interactivity with the instructor did I get it right? Yes. Okay. Um, Kahoot, uh, as I showed you, uh, enables the students right to uh, answer the questions. You have the option, by the way, to add a slide after each question, the, um, explaining why this question was right or wrong. Uh, you can insert your feedback. This is one point. The second point is that we didn't um, advise using Kahoot solely in the curriculum, right? We made it um, with variable flavors. We, the students has interaction with us in lectures, right, and labs. And in the same time, they got um, that challenging flavor with the Kahoot quiz in their homes. We don't need to make all uh, the tools used with the same flavor to avoid the sensing boring sensation of students. Imagine with me that we used only Kahoot with the traditional pre-recorded lectures, for example. I think that students may not be that motivated to use the Kahoot. I think, but we didn't do research, uh, by the way, on that. And you may do that. One of the uh, attendees can do a research with one tool and uh, tell us what our uh, students' perspectives. Like, but in our curriculum, uh, it was like a, fr a fruit salad uh, with each tool has a, a complementary effect to other tools. Did I answer your question? Okay. Now, uh, Maya Ahmad, please. She raised the hand. Yes, doctor. Uh, there are several questions in the chat. Can I read them, please? Uh, okay. Uh, yes. For, okay, okay. Let's take a question from Khalid Abu Shaisha. Then I will answer the questions in the chat box. Okay, yes. I ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, Khalid. Uh, hi, doctor. Uh, I'm asking, uh, I, I like this part about the simulation where you did the doctor part and another another student did the patient part. And yeah. uh, I'm asking, since we have, uh, since we were talking about integration of uh, data uh, dig digitization and uh, healthcare, so I'm asking if there is, um, if pr Professor Ahmed al is still here, can someone design like a simple software that can do the imitation of the, uh, or the simulation of a role player 
easier to be able to interact with more students at the same time? Actually, your question is very good. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Ahmad is not here. However, uh, the idea of the role play uh, is not um, in itself my idea. Actually, I got the idea from a software um, of virtual patient learning, actually. But in the, I, I found the software somewhat maybe expensive. So... Uh, my thinking was how to substitute it with something that uh, is cheap and that in the same time will stimulate uh, students' minds to think about the patient and will be a nice application for a simplified learning. By the way, these are these students were first year students, and yeah. we don't need to. Um, to interact with um, uh, a complicated platform. I know that there are simple platforms, but I think in, in, in the stage, we were in, in an emergency, by the way, the COVID-19 emergency, we, uh, even if we are in the second year, we are still um, discovering what are the best methods to teach with, right? Yeah. So um, maybe we will not uh, spend a lot of money here, but if we have computer science or engineering uh, stuff that can help us, it will be so good. It will be amazing. They can uh, cooperate with uh, medical staff and we will provide something at first, even if it is a prototype, will be helpful for first year and second year students who don't meet many patients. So the idea is very good. However, I hope that uh, someone want to share uh, the achieving it with us and I will be more than happy. Even if uh, you, because you, Khaled, know the programming, right? <laughs> yeah, doctor. Uh, that's, uh, 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 thank you for your answer. And I'm asking this because uh, when we're taking any kind of Royal College examination, especially people who are doing like MRCP or MRCS or PLAB or whatever exams, it's the same role play. It's person to person. So uh, even in the UK, they, they, they didn't adapt this software system up till now. Uh, and uh, that's why I was asking. Some people like prefer like uh, to have a role player, uh, like uh, a doctor acting as a role player, and another one acting as a, a patient or a doctor for more interaction. Some people believe this is better than software in this term. Yeah, this is cheaper actually. <laughs> I don't know. I think the opposite. <laughs> I, 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 uh, this is my perception from my point of view, actually, not uh, others' point of view. So thank you. And yeah. actually, if someone wants to share with us to achieve something like that, I would be more than happy. We can do an uh, international collaboration, for example. Um, we can connect and it would be uh, so good and will be fruitful for stu our students. Yeah. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you. Okay, my uh, yes. okay, okay. Uh, are there any oral questions? Just that chat box. Okay, my please. Yeah. Uh, mm? Shuri Muhammad is asking: Is it does it take too long to prepare for this way of teaching? Um, actually, the success of uh, any uh, teaching method or anything in life uh, requires a lot of preparation, actually. But this is for the first time. For the first time, when you design instructional methods and how will I teach my students, this will take time. But after that, you will repeat your curriculum over consecutive years or even maybe over consecutive modules, right? Uh, you will find that the time is very short. But the first time actually takes some time yeah yeah yes um i'm uh, iman uh, shita is asking uh -huh. how can we deal with those students who refuse to participate in the lecture and what will happen if we have a huge number of students how can we deal with them Mm. Actually, we will. Uh, by, uh, the, uh, there is a theory of autonomous motivation. Autonomous motivation is that we want students to be motivated from inside. Okay, this is different from that. You ask, hey, okay, you are good. This is actually external motivation, right? For autonomous motivation to be implemented, you need to um, explain to students why you are you doing that and how will uh, this benefits him. I think this is one of the methods. Uh, actually, I experienced that, by the way. Um, in my uh, previous curricula, I just uh, say, uh, ask them to do that, do this. And I didn't explain the benefit. I explained the method, of course, but I didn't explain the benefit. But 
although I was in an e-learning uh, approach, I um, try to explain the benefit of every tool used and what I expect from them. This is uh, this increased the students' motivation to their learning. And uh, also there is another way by uh, the way you don't have to do everything live. For example, the virtual learning stations, you can use it distantly without, but will not be interactive with you. But the student may, may be interactive with himself. Like what? You can record the lecture in the form of station. For example, you can uh, put station number one and uh, put the material on the slide. You are, you are having a recorded lecture, by the way. You are, will do, uh, we put the material on a chunk of the material on the slide. Then after that, and you will ask the student to read this chunk. After that, you will do the, uh, write in the next slide the task and ask students to solve this task. And after that, you will um, do uh, we will insert a, a slide with the solution and explanation. This is for station number one. And in your recording, you will ask student to pause the video and to try to read himself and try to do the task. This method. Uh, does not guarantee that a uh, student will interact. Actually, um, maybe he will uh, jump to the explanation part. Um, and you will not know uh, unless you, um, for example, as, um, ask in the survey, did you, um, or, uh, or if you uh, monitor if your video on the YouTube, you can monitor um, how much time students spent on this video. This may... Um, May, may, this may give you a chance to re monitor students' uh, interaction with your lectures. Um, there are, uh, um, like, but in, uh, before that, there are also other methods uh, that make students interact, even if it is not live, like interactive videos uh, presented by a platform called Edpuzzle. By the way, you can uh, insert questions after each chunk of information inside the lecture, and you can make the questions required to pass this part to the next chunk of the lecture. And student will have to uh, answer the question, so you will make sure that he listened actually and got the point. But uh, we can't force students. Students are somewhat, uh, they are adults. They, they, you can't force students, all your students, to interact, actually, whatever you did. What do you uh, do that you try to enhance their autonomous motivation? Relevance of information to the real practice enhances autonomous motivation of students also. So you will discuss or explain for students why we are doing that, uh, how will they benefit from that, and try to make the information, the, the method relevant to real practice. These are my advices and actually it's not my own advances. You can read more about autonomous motivation theory uh, and how we can um, create motivation inside students to, um, to, be, to care about their learning process. I hope I answered your question. And by the way, by the way, uh, this method used can be done for a large uh, number of students. Actually, uh, our batch is um, of 1,000 students, but those who agreed to um, uh, or consented to um, be uh, involved in our uh, research were the 600. So actually, we did that for 1,000 students. So you can do that, but you may, uh, the, the Zoom, as you know, has limited free capacity after that uh, it needs subscription microsoft teams may be uh, better in the uh, capacity um, option uh, however these methods are all applicable to large um, large enrollment uh, classes of medical schools doctor can we please unmute uh, sherry so that she can ask her own question okay uh Unmute. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Papa. Okay. Uh, actually, hello. it was a very nice uh, lecture. Really, really. I never enjoyed uh, such le lecture like this. Uh, so I have one question. Uh, do, uh, 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 did you do this um, uh, model of teaching uh, from scratch or you are following... Um, an established method by others, and so and you are doing your own touch on it. Actually, from the scratch. However, I have a background, right? Because oh. as I uh, told you, I tried the Kahoot 
during the face-to-face -face learning. And I found students enjoying that. So I decided to insert it again in um, my design curriculum. The virtual learning stations also I tried the learning station concept, face-to-face -face learning. Actually, it was implemented before the COVID-19 pandemic in a lecture in uh, our school. Actually, I got the idea of learning stations. Then I uh, applied it an, in a new context. I um, found the idea um, motivating or challenging or fun. So I asked myself, what if I applied it in, uh, uh, to my students' lectures and see what happens? Actually, it, it, it was like that. And students, I found uh, students' responses were great and they were engaged and entertained with their learning, actually. Um, I think I may have um, medical education basis, like I want students to think, analyze, and create. I have that uh, uh, background, not from myself, because I studied or I read or attended workshops, whatever. But uh, the application and in the different contexts, no, this comes for me. That's why, by the way, you will find that many of the tools used are in uh, recently published research or uh, accepted abstracts in conferences because they are new methods uh, applied in new contexts. Maybe the method, not I didn't invent the method, maybe in some instances, but I applied it in a new context and um, I found good results. That's why... Uh, uh, that's why they got accepted in in the journals or the conferences. So uh, you need some imagination, but with a background. What I need my students to feel like or to do. I hope I uh, could answer your question with that. Yeah, it, uh, really, it's a very nice lecture, really. And Thanks. I think it, uh, you have done uh, a huge effort. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, the work is uh, showing itself. Thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatma. And I do have any other questions? I don't think so. Yeah? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Uh, kindly, ki kindly, um, uh, for, um, fill the form. Uh, there is an attendance form here because many of you are uh, registered as the guests. So you will find an attendance form in the chat box. Please uh, fill it. Okay. Or you can copy the link and uh, fill it after the session. Uh, now, uh, before saying goodbye, uh, we want to take uh, to have a memory of uh, being here together, celebrating the International Pathology Day uh, with Hilwa Medical School, and we hope that repeat uh, we repeat all together the, exper the experience again. So kindly, I will ask you uh, to open your cameras for just a few seconds, and we will take screenshots if you um, agree to take uh, your photos. If you don't, you can just... Um, uh, be with uh, don't open the camera and be with uh, the current state of your uh, video position uh, Abrahman kindly uh, stop uh, sharing the presentation and we will do a gallery uh, okay Thanks a lot for being here with us. Actually, uh, we enjoyed meeting you. And okay, so so should we take new photos or what? Should we? Take yes, please. Some people want to participate. They're sending messages in the chat. Yeah, so yeah. I opened it uh, for you guys, and now you can open your cameras. I can see some people already started doing it. Yeah. Perfect. We're so happy to see each and every one of you. Yeah. Okay, let's do it now. And some are still starting to open their cameras. Yeah. I should uh, say three to one, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's a nice group of attendees. I hope you opened your cameras from the start to miss you <laughs> and do some social interaction. Uh, thanks a lot. We really enjoyed being with you today and we hope that you 
uh, had some beneficial points from the event. This is the point at uh, the end. Um, in the few days, maybe uh, the next week, you will receive an email asking um, for your feedback about the event. And on submission of your feedback, you will receive automatically on the same email you inserted uh, for the feedback, uh, you will receive your uh, certificate. Uh, please, uh, uh, please, uh, if you don't find the email, you can check your junk or spam inbox. And if you still have a problem, you can contact us. You have our emails with the event announcement. I hope you don't uh, face any problems. Thanks a lot. If anyone needs uh, any question or um, if you have um, last minute uh, moments to share, uh, the mic is yours. You can raise your hands and then we will unmute you. Abdurrahman, can you share the screen, the, the presentation, please? Okay. Um, before, a last, a last moment before. Uh, we share. Thanks for my task force, Students Task Force. Uh, they really did a great job and they um, they were good trainers and good organizers and have innovative ideas, by the way. Uh, I thank them uh, very much for their, uh, their effort for today. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Abrahman. Okay, it's good. Okay, I will uh, now tell you goodbye and again, good evening, good afternoon, good morning for those who are not uh, on the same time zone. And, uh, and goodbye for you all. Uh, see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.